Peripheral artery disease. PAD of the upper extremities is characterized by pain with exertion and can cause gangrene and ulceration. It's more common in patients who've had lower extremity occlusive disease. A blood pressure differential of 15 between arms suggests stenosis and warrants further testing. Initial testing in symptomatic patients includes arterial duplex ultrasound of the upper extremities. CC angiography and MR may be appropriate to clarify the diagnosis or plan intervention. Guideline directed therapy for PAD includes low dose aspirin, moderate to high intensity statin therapy, an ACE inhibitor, or ARB, structured exercise program, smoking cessation. Moralgia parasthetica. This is a common cause of anterior lateral hip pain and dysethesia. It's caused by a compression of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve as it courses under the inguinal ligament into the subcutaneous tissue of the thigh. Tapping over this area during the exam can reproduce pain or symptoms. Obesity is a common cause of this condition. Diabetes is associated with a sevenfold higher incidence over the general population. The anterior lateral thigh would represent the L3 to L4 dermatome. So this is very high yield. Remember, myalgia parasitica, it affects the anterior lateral side. It can cause anterior lateral hip pain and is due to a compression of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. A common cause is obesity, and there's a higher incidence in patients with diabetes mellitus. Also remember that dermatome. That's a nice way that examiners like to bring back some anatomy that you should know. Cauda equina syndrome presents with saddle anesthesia and generally marked neurologic disability. Diabetic neuropathy is a peripheral neuropathy initially affecting distal structures such as the toes and feet. Femoral neuropathy would affect sensation in the anterior medial thigh and medial lower leg with weakness in the quadriceps muscle group. If a patient has a positive straight leg raising test and back pain, this is evidence of an S1 issue. Thyroid nodules. The first step in the evaluation of a palpable thyroid nodule is to obtain a TSH level and perform thyroid ultrasound. If a patient has a low TSH, a radionucleotide thyroid uptake scan is the appropriate next step to assess for a hyperfunctioning nodule. If the TSH level is normal or high, next steps are determined by the size and characteristics of the thyroid nodule on ultrasound. Fine needle aspiration or FNA may be indicated depending on the size and nodule characteristics. Molecular testing of FNA specimens is useful in order to guide management of thyroid nodules with indeterminate cytology. The 2016 CHESS guidelines strongly support the recommendation to do three months of anticoagulation after a first episode of a provoked proximal DVT of the leg. So let's talk about necroveins. Patients with this condition have a history of an atraumatic onset of radial sided wrist pain. It is a common overuse injury involving the tendons of the first dorsal compartment, specifically the AB or abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. It's most common in women 30 to 50 years of age and often occurs in new mothers who frequently pick up a child. 
pain localizes to the radial styloid, and this can be reproduced by the Finkelstein's test, which involves placing the thumb inside a closed fist followed by ulnar deviation of the wrist. Focal tenderness in the anatomic snuff box would suggest injury to the scaphoid, which is in the differential diagnosis for radial sided wrist pain. Although it usually occurs through direct trauma as they fall onto an outstretched hand. Colon cancer. The recommended interval for colon cancer screening with multi target stool DNA testing is three years at minimum, with the USPTF recommending an interval of one to three years. If the screening is positive, Proceeding with a colonoscopy is recommended. Fecal immunochemical testing or FIT has an annual screening interval if the test is negative. A colonoscopy is recommended if the FIT is positive. Colonoscopy for patients without risk factors should be performed every 10 years or sooner if indicated by pathology results or risk factors. COPD. Initial treatment is with smoking cessation, long-acting agonist or LABA, or a long-acting muscarinic antagonist or LAMA. If symptoms persist with either of those inhaled medications, then combination therapy should be initiated. An inhaled corticosteroid can be added to the lava lama regimen for triple therapy if symptoms continue. Long-term use of an ICS or inhaled corticosteroid as monotherapy is not recommended due to a slight increase in the incidence of pneumonia. So as you can see, the initial treatment for COPD is similar to like a step-up treatment as for asthma patients. So first, smoking cessation, then a LABA or LAMA. If this doesn't work, use a LABA and LAMA together. If those two together don't work, then we need triple therapy. Add an inhaled corticosteroid to that, but never use the inhaled corticosteroids by itself. When a COPD exacerbation is caused by infectious agents, it may be bacterial or viral. Gold guidelines support the use of antibiotics in patients with an acute COPD exacerbation with the three cardinal symptoms of increased dyspnea, increased sputum volume, increased sputum purulence and in patients who require invasive or non-invasive mechanical ventilation. So increased dyspnea, increased sputum volume, increased sputum purulence, and mechanical ventilation. In those scenarios, you can use antibiotics to treat the COPD exacerbation. If a patient has a fever and hypoxemia, even though this is often seen in the setting of COPD exacerbations, they do not provide as strong an indication for treatment with antibiotics. Diffuse wheezing. Now, this is a hallmark examination finding that is present in most COPD exacerbations, regardless of the underlying cause. Leukocytosis is a relatively nonspecific marker for acute inflammation and may be seen with either viral or bacterial etiologies. So basically, this slide is bringing up the fact that if you see a, if you see a patient that has diffuse wheezing, they're hypoxic or have fever and leukocytosis, those aren't the cardinal symptoms for using antibiotics. It's the increased dyspnea, increased sputum volume, increased sputum purulence, as in patients who require invasive or non-invasive mechanical ventilation. Eating disorders. A DEXA scan is recommended to assess for low bone mineral 
identity in patients with suspected or diagnosed eating disorders. Other appropriate screenings include orthostatic vital signs, a basic metabolic panel, a CBC, magnesium, phosphorus, pre-albumin, and amylase levels, thyroid testing, and an EKG. Hormonal contraception. Obtaining a thorough medical history is standard practice, but the Choosing Wisely campaign recommends against requiring a pelvic or other physical exam prior to prescribing oral contraceptives. So if a question asks you, hey, a patient comes in, she wants to do, um, she wants to start some contraception, uh, will she need to do like a pelvic exam before the answer is no, she doesn't need to do a pelvic exam before you prescribe oral contraceptives. It is unnecessary to wait to begin hormonal contraception until after the next menses, as inadvertent exposure to oral contraception will not harm an early pregnancy. Prescribing a one-year supply of hormonal contraceptives improves adherence and lowers costs. There is a broad consensus that sexually transmitted infection screening and pap smears should not be required to prescribe contraception. Orthostatic hypotension. So to treat this condition, you need to identify and address the underlying cause or causes when possible. This may include correcting a reversible medical condition or discontinuing an offending medication. Can you think of any drugs that can cause orthostatic hypotension? Leave them in the comment section below. Non-pharmacologic measures should be initiated next and typically include increasing fluid and sodium intake, improving physical fitness, wearing compression garments, and avoiding hot and humid environments. When additional treatment is needed, first-line medication options include droxidopa, which acts by increasing peripheral vascular resistance. Off-label use of drugs like atomoxetine may be considered as adjunct therapy, but these medications are not part of the initial management. The alpha antagonist clonidine typically causes a decrease in blood pressure through central action on the sympathetic nervous system. In patients with autonomic dysfunction, however, clonidine can increase venous return without a blood pressure lowering effect and therefore improve orthostatic hypotension, but it should only be considered a supplementary treatment. Phenylephrine may also be considered as a second line option, but this is not a part of the initial management of orthostatic hypotension. Maturity onset diabetes of the young or MODI is a form of diabetes in non-obese young adults under the age of 30 who have preserved pancreatic cell function. Nearly 80% of patients with MODI are misdiagnosed as having type 1 or type 2 diabetes. These patients exhibit no signs of insulin resistance. For example, metabolic syndrome, acanthosis nigricans, skin tags, and androgenic alopecia. They are not obese, have positive C-peptide levels, and have a strong family history of diabetes. Modi does not respond to metformin, but because beta cell function is preserved, the hyperglycemia does respond to sulfonylureas. A balanced diet of appropriate portions and low carbohydrates are also necessary in patients with MODI. Insulin is required only during pregnancy for these patients. Low back pain. If acetaminophen and NSAIDs are ineffective when used alone, the most appropriate next step 
is a combination of both medications. Acetaminophen and NSAID combinations have been shown to be more effective for acute pain than either agent alone. Other options should be tried before prescribing opioids, such as a hydrocodone acetaminophen combination or oxycodone. You can also implement short-term use of muscle relaxants with NSAIDs as well. Basically, you want to try every combination and everything you can before going to opioids. So opioids should not be your first step when a patient comes in with low back pain. Hepatitis A post-exposure prophylaxis. All unvaccinated household contacts and sexual contacts should receive post-exposure prophylaxis following significant exposure to hepatitis A within the previous two weeks. Healthy individuals 12 months to 40 years of age should receive the hepatitis A vaccine as prophylaxis. However, infants less than 12 months of age should receive immune globulin as post-exposure prophylaxis. Individuals older than 40 years of age, as well as immunocompromised patients, should receive both the hepatitis A vaccine and immune globulin. Again, I can't stress enough how high yield this slide is. Knowing post-exposure prophylaxis is extremely important, so definitely commit this slide to memory. Pertussis Azithromycin is the most appropriate for the management of pertussis. Azithromycin is most effective for treatment and minimizing spread of the disease within 21 days of symptom onset. Macrolides such as erythromycin are also acceptable options. Wound care. The most important aspect of infection prevention in treating a superficial wound is cleaning and irrigation. Studies have shown that irrigation with tap water provides similar outcomes compared to sterile saline. Antiseptic solutions such as hydrogen peroxide are not more effective than tap water and can be caustic to wound tissue and may delay healing very, very high yield. Antibiotics should be used for treatment of wound infections. However, non-infected wounds do not routinely require antibiotic prophylaxis unless there is an increased risk of infection. Risk factors for a wound infection include bite wounds, delayed presentation, retained foreign material, insufficient cleaning, puncture or crush wounds, open fractures, significant immunocompromise, and joint cartilage or tendon involvement. Patients with three or more doses of tetanus toxoid with the most recent vaccination within the past five years do not require tetanus booster or tetanus immune globulin for prophylaxis, regardless of the type of wound. Crew. This condition peaks in fall and winter months. Diagnosis is purely clinical and does not require lab studies, viral cultures, or imaging. The treatment of croup includes corticosteroids such as dexamethasone in mild cases and the addition of epinephrine in moderate to severe cases. The inhalation of humidified air does not improve outcomes nor does nebulize albuterol. MET or MET is the amount of energy used by the body per minute of activity. Light intensity is less than 3 METs and includes activities such as sitting at a desk, light housework, casual walking, and stretching. Moderate intensity is 3 to 5.9 METs and includes brisk walking, water aerobics, and ballroom dancing. Vigorous intensity is 6 METs and is represented by activities such as High intensity interval training, jogging, and heavy gardening. Pityriasis versicolor. 
This is a superficial infection caused by yeast in the genus Melissasia, and treatment includes topical selenium sulfide, topical antifungals such as terbinafin and meconazole are the other first-line options. Oral fluconazole can be used, but oral therapy is usually reserved for when topical treatment is impractical or unsuccessful. Male infertility. A semen analysis is the first step in the evaluation of male infertility. In males with oligozoospermia, especially if the sperm count is less than 10, the American Urological Association recommends an endocrine evaluation with an FSH level and early morning total testosterone levels. The results of that testing can dictate next steps. Oppositional Defiant Disorder The DSM-5 criteria for a diagnosis of ODD includes frequently losing one's temper, being easily annoyed, antagonism toward authority figures, deliberately annoying others, placing blame on others, and being spiteful or vindictive. These symptoms must occur for at least six months, cause distress or negative impacts, and not occur exclusively with substance use or in the course of a psychotic, depressive, or bipolar disorder. Treatment of common comorbid mental health conditions can be associated with an improvement in ODD. So it is very important to evaluate for ADHD, depression, and anxiety disorders, as well as ODD. Patients with ODD have a high risk of developing other mental health conditions later, and early therapy is recommended. Medication is rarely indicated for ODD and not as monotherapy. Therapy should generally include both child therapy and parent training. Hypertension. The USPTF recommends screening for hypertension with office blood pressure measurements in adults older than 18 years of age. Adults older than 40 and those greater than 18 with risk factors should receive annual hypertension screening. Less frequent screening is recommended for adults 18 to 39 without risk factors. The USPTF recommends abdominal duplex ultrasound for men 65 to 75 years of age who have ever smoked, which is usually defined as 100 cigarettes or more in a lifetime. Influenza vaccine. This vaccine is safe to administer regularly to those who have only had hives after exposure to eggs. If more serious allergic symptoms occur with egg exposure, such as respiratory distress or anaphylaxis, the influenza vaccine should be administered in an inpatient or supervised outpatient setting. Pre-medication with diphenhydramine or prednisone is not recommended.